Well, good morning and welcome to St. John United Church of Christ. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. Just a few announcements this morning. Uh, listen, we're working really hard to still be the church in the time of this isolation. So uh, Judy Daly and Laurel Brailer are organizing groups of people to contact members and friends of the congregation to keep in touch or just to see if there are any unmet needs there, uh, especially those who are in the at-risk category should not be going out shopping. So we're organizing some people to actually be able to go out and do some shopping for you. So you can call either of them or call the church office at 419-782-4176. Also, we are doing pub theology on, online weekly now on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Uh, there is information on the screen on how to connect there. There is also a password. Zoom is now requiring passwords for all meetings. So just contact uh, me at 248-515-5522 and I will give you that password to be able to connect. And we are not uh, getting altar flowers during this time of isolation because it was just too much risk with the delivery of the flowers and people picking them up and so forth. But certainly if you had planned on having flowers for a particular purpose or event or remembrance, please let the church office know and we'll be sure to include them in our PowerPoint for our online worship. I also wanted to mention that we will have a virtual communion and tenebrae service for Monday, Thursday. I will be doing that via Zoom. Information is on our Facebook page and will be going out via the um, constant contact distribution. Uh, Good Friday, there will also be a station, Stations of the Cross, a virtual Stations of the Cross that will be done. Um, I'm estimating maybe 30 minutes it will take or so and that will be on noon on Good Friday. And again, it will be a Zoom meeting, virtual meeting, and the password is available um, through me or through the Facebook event. I also wanted to mention that Easter Sunday will also be a virtual service at 1030 only. We will be having virtual communion. And when I say virtual communion, any of you who are at home watching or listening I invite you to be prior to those services to gather elements that you can use for communion and just use whatever you have available at home. Don't bother going out and getting special bread or wine or, or grape juice. Use what you have, if, even if it's crackers or cookies and milk. I had one colleague who did virtual communion and they said one of their families, and the only thing they had was cookies and milk. Whatever works for you and we will be communing together as part of that service. Uh, and lastly, there will be a spiritual council meeting at 7 p.m. on Monday, also via Zoom. So I think that's all the um, announcements we have for this morning. So now let us join together our hearts and minds and get into a spirit of worship as Sally plays a little piece uh, on the organ.
I invite you to join with me in centering our hearts in worship. Awake to the day of triumph for our Savior. Give thanks for this day that leads to the cross. Come with your branches, hosannas, and songs. Fill the air with welcome to the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So let us face this day of palms and Jesus' passion with honesty, confessing our sin before God. Holy God, sure of your faithfulness, even in your dying, comforted by your compassion toward your people in every age, we beg your mercy for our imperfect gratitude. We have looked to you for your mercy when you have given everything. We have withheld your people, our neighbors, and from your creation, our earth, the care and tending they deserve. We have rejected the cornerstone you sent to build a people of righteousness even here today. Forgive our failings, heal what we have broken, nurture what we have neglected, and lead us to your vision so that we may know the peace of your wholeness in Jesus' name. Amen. Your God has come to you humble in the form of a slave to free you from the weight of sin and death. Jesus' obedient suffering has released you. Your sins are forgiven. In the name of the one who, it, who is exalted beyond what we can comprehend, Christ our Savior and Lord. We live as children of the light for the Christ shines on us. And now for the message to the young and young at heart. You know, it seems funny to have a little Halloween photo up on the screen, but that's actually a photo from the Halloween parade in Defiance last October. Did any of you go to that parade? I mean, it was a really good parade for social distancing. It was raining so hard that there were a couple of rivers running down Clinton Street on both sides of the road next to the curb, and they were several inches deep. And there were only a few people who braved the weather to watch the parade. Well, today is Palm Sunday, and it's a day we celebrate Jesus entering Jerusalem. And normally, when we would gather together in person, we would have palms and we would be having a parade around the sanctuary. So just imagine that happening with Jesus. But when kings entered a town or village, they usually rode in on a large war horse accompanied by soldiers. And in a way, I was thinking it's kind of like our politicians who ride in the Halloween parade in fancy cars. Jesus was called the Messiah and the Anointed One, or the King of Israel. But when Jesus entered Jerusalem, he wasn't on a big war horse. He was on a simple donkey. And I got to thinking that's kind of like our politicians riding in the Halloween parade on a, on a scooter or a bicycle instead of a fancy car. When Jesus rode into town, there were lots of people there who placed their coats and their palm leaves and their branches from trees on the ground in front of Jesus to show him respect by laying down things that would prevent his feet from actually touching the ground. Now, the people cried out, Hosanna to Jesus, as he rode by, which actually means, God help us. But Jesus didn't end up being the leader the people thought he would be, but instead showed us how to live in relationship with one another and with God. Jesus opened the door for us to know God intimately. And Jesus showed us and wants us to be humble in our love of God and our love for each other to not think that we are better than anyone else in any way, but simply love one another as we love God and as God loves us. We are to love life, we are to love God, and we are to love our neighbor as ourself. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, we are so grateful for Jesus' entry into our own lives. Help us always to be excited and, and grateful to be walking with Jesus and to have Jesus always with us. We know in this coming week of this Holy Week, we get ready for Jesus' death on the cross on Friday. 
But since we're on the other side of that, we already know what happens on Easter. So help us live into the resurrection and know that Christ is always with us. Amen. And now for an organ of meditation played once again by Sally Myers. We certainly celebrate Christ walking with us daily as we lift one another in prayer. I'll try to summarize each of the prayers that I know of, and if there's any that you may have, you can feel free to text me at 248-515-5522 right now, and I will gladly raise those prayers up. I'll try to summarize each prayer and say, Lord, in your mercy, and ask that you respond here our prayer. I would like to lift up uh, Katie and Ben Polson. Ben is the pastor of Poplar Ridge Church, not too far from us. And Katie is an on-call chaplain with me at Mercy Hospital. And she's pregnant. And they will be inducing labor on Wednesday in the midst of all that's going on. Uh, ben will be allowed to be with her in the delivery room, but uh, no one else will. And, and um, her parents, for whom this is their first grandchild, won't be able to see their child until all of this um, coronavirus thing is passed. So will you lift Katie and Ben Polson in your prayers, Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. i also like to lift up Wayne Schaefer, who was hospitalized last week. Um, I haven't heard whether he's back out of the hospital yet, but continue to hold him and um, his wife Sally in your prayers. Sally was unable to visit him, and I am unable to visit him in the hospital. Lord, in your mercy. <clears throat> and also Mary Jane Davis, who I understand was also hospitalized this week. I got a call from Mercy Hospital to let me know she is there. Um, but again, I am unable to visit. So if you would hold Mary Jane Davis in your prayer, Lord, in your mercy. So let us gather together all these prayers that we have heard together with those that we hold in our hearts or those you may be speaking aloud at home and lift them up to God in a small period of, short period of silence, listening for God and lifting these prayers to God, confident that God knows and hears our deepest needs and concerns and our greatest joys, whether we can bring them to our lips or not.
Compassionate God, we have remembered the day you rode into town on a colt. We have remembered the people who rushed to sing your praises. We have remembered the sense of excitement that you were going to do something new and amazing. But we also remember that those same people soon changed their song from Hosanna to crucify him. We remember that a lot changed in just a few days. We remember that you went willingly to the cross for them and for us. God, you sent your son Jesus so that we might know that you love us. You sent your son Jesus to bring peace and healing to the whole world. You sent Jesus to show us a new way of living, an alternative way of living. Help us today to share the message of love in whatever way we can during this time of isolation. Help us to bring healing to our broken world by staying home. And help us to be a part of bringing peace to all the places where there is no peace today. Help us to keep on doing the work that Jesus began, to keep on carrying our cross so that all people might come to know love, peace, and healing. We pray now in a moment's silence for the people and situations we know that we know where your love, peace, and healing are needed this day, especially those who continue to work in the midst of this pandemic because all of our lives depend on them. And we thank you, God, for hearing our prayers. Help us to go out into the world, at least electronically and by telephone, to live and love the world from our homes. In Jesus' name, we pray all this, as we pray in the way that he taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, both now and forever. Amen. We continue to do the work, even in the midst of this shutdown, and hope that at this time you will prepare an envelope to send in your gift, or or connect with our Tithely account online to give your gifts electronically. The address is on the screen, and it has also been sent out via our constant contact blast. So let our hazanas to the one who brings liberation take form in our tithes and our offerings.
Will you join with me in the dedication of these gifts? God of all good gifts, we thank you for showing us how to care for each other. May these gifts lead to great feasting for those who have no banquets set before them. May these gifts build shelters and places of prayer for those who are homeless. May these gifts proclaim your desire that all your creation live in peace. Give us grateful hearts, O oh God, in the name of the one who comes to draw all people to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Will you join me in prayer? Let your word, O oh God, break open our hearts this day through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we may enter into the coming Holy Week with the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Amen. The first reading is taken from the book of Psalms, chapter 118, verses 1 through 2 and 19 through 29, and I will be reading from the Common English Bible. Give thanks to the Lord because he is good, because his faithful love lasts forever. Let Israel say it, God's faithful love lasts forever. Open the gates of righteousness for me so that I can come in and give thanks to the Lord. This is the Lord's gate. Those who are righteous enter through it. I thank you because you answered me, because you were my saving help. The stone rejected by the builders is now the main foundation stone. <clears throat> Excuse me. This has happened because of the Lord. It is astounding in our sight. This is the day the Lord acted. We will rejoice and celebrate in it. <coughs> Lord, please save us. Lord, please let us succeed. The one who enters in the Lord's name is blessed. We blessed all of you from the Lord's house. The Lord is God. He has shined a light on us. So lead the festal offering with ropes all the way to the horns of the altar. You are my God. I will give thanks to you. You are my God. I will lift you up. Give thanks to the Lord because he is good, because his faithful love lasts forever. Here ends the reading of the psalm. And the second reading is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. And again, I'm reading from the Common English Bible. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus gave two disciples a task. He said to them, go into the village over there. As soon as you enter, you will find a donkey tied up with a colt with it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that their master needs them. He sent them off right away. Now this happened to fulfill what the prophet said. Say to daughter Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the donkey's offspring. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had ordered them. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them. Then he sat on them. Now a large crowd spread their clothes on the road. Others cut palm branches off the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds in front of him and behind him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, blessing on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up. Who is this, they asked. The crowd answered, it's the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The Holy Spirit breathes these words into us. Well, everyone loves a parade, even me. So I was pleasantly surprised soon after moving into our house in Jefferson that while our street paralleled one of the main streets of J-Town, it was, it was on the route that was used by most of the hometown parades. Unlike Defiance, which I think only has one parade, the Halloween parade, Jefferson must have had four or five parades, most of which either started and ended at the high school or at the fairgrounds, both of which were at the end of our street. We could literally sit on our front porch and watch the parade go by. Now Jefferson 
is a town of under 4,000 people, a village the residents would admonish me, not a city. So the parades were a typical small town Americana. The most prominent features were the high school marching band, the, the local dance studio and baton twirling club, the local politicians, and of course, the fire trucks. Our dog Finnegan was not that big of a fan of the latter, as there was just too much noise and too much flashing lights, the very things that were meant to get our attention in an emergency, well, they got him just a little bit excited. Now, for some reason, during this time of the pandemic, my thoughts turned to the Lions Club Halloween parade that we had last October. And as I mentioned in the, the children's message, it was, it was a horrible night. It was raining so hard, there were literally small rivers running down both sides of Clinton along the curb. And there really were only a handful of people along the parade route and not that many floats. In fact, I was told that it's probably the shortest parade we've ever had for Halloween. Well, at one point, I looked down at the water flowing along the gutter and saw about a dozen pieces of candy floating down the street on their way to the storm sewer. To me, an apt message for that evening. I mean, it was a rather sorry event for most, but those who did brave the elements, well, they, they tried really hard to exhibit as much enthusiasm as they could for the people in the parade, because by God, they were there for a parade. Well, the gospel lesson for today talks of another parade of sorts, and in their book, the last week, John Dominic Crossan and Marcus Borg describe how Jesus came into Jerusalem through the East Gate in a very, very low-key way. Surrounded by peasants, the urban poor and the spiritually hungry as well, holding palm branches and exuberantly full of praise and hope, Jesus rode in to a donkey and her colt. Now, Crossan and Borg describe a scene in which there are actually two processions that day, one from the east gate and one from the west, through the west gate, the front gate, if you will. And Jesus entered the east gate, which was considered the back gate of the town. And the front gate, the west gate, was where Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, rode in on a war horse. Now, many scholars and historians suggest that this may have been possible since Pontius Pilate was known to parade into Jerusalem on the first day of Passover, surrounded by chariots, horses, and foot soldiers, putting on a huge display of Rome's military might to remind the Jews just before Passover who it was who had authority, who it was who ruled the town. Now, sometimes I think during this coronavirus, we we could use a distraction like a parade. And it would have been nice to think that with Easter coming up next week, we might have been allowed to gather and celebrate the resurrection. I mean, it would, have been, would not have been quite a parade, but certainly a hope-filled event. But it's just not realistic to think that we would be okay, that our faith would protect us. We still need to stay home and flatten the curve. And history, gives us an example why. By the end of the summer in 1918, the U.S. was nearing the end of World War I, and major cities across the nation were planning liberty loan parades to help promote government bonds that would be used to pay off the war debt. Just as the parades began to take shape, the flu pandemic of 1918 began to sweep across the, the nation in earnest. And unfortunately, the director of public health in Philadelphia ignored the growing concerns of other medical experts after 600 sailors fell ill in the Philadelphia Naval Yard. So 200,000 people crammed the streets of Philadelphia like sardines in a can to watch the parade. Within 72 hours of the event, Every bed in Philadelphia's 31 hospitals was filled. Within a couple weeks, more than 4,500 people had died in Philadelphia. Now in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the East Gate to shouts of those most feeling the oppression of the Roman Empire. And he entered even knowing what lay ahead. He knew 
that the empire and those in collusion with it saw him as a threat to their power. The people had hoped that he was the Messiah, the one who would bring the power and might that would help them to overthrow their oppressors. And so they gathered in hope. Now the Roman emperor claimed to be a divinely sanctioned authority. And as Kate Huey writes, so the way things were, were that way because their God decided it should be so. Works out well for the Romans and the wealthy, she writes, but not so much for the people under their heel. Those giving praise and honor to Jesus as he came into Jerusalem believed he would lead the resurrection that would free them. And they believed that the way to freedom was with the very violence and power that oppressed them, which they hoped Jesus would lead. But Jesus had an alternative way. You all remember the temptation of Jesus just after his baptism and before his ministry began? Jesus wandered in the desert and fasted for 40 days. And at the end of those 40 days, Satan came to him and tempted Jesus to use his power, to use his relationship with God for his own use, for power and control. Satan tried to convince Jesus of all the good he could do with ultimate power and authority, with earthly power, with power without any oversight, as long as Jesus pledged allegiance to him. But Jesus had an alternative way. Jesus would not succumb. Jesus would not rely on his own power, but only on God's love. Now the juxtaposition of Pilate on a war horse, surrounded by symbols of might against Jesus on a donkey, tethered to a colt, well, I think that says something powerful about the power of God. Jesus would not use his power and authority to accomplish earthly goals, but instead trusted in God. He leaned into God's love for the world. As the authors of the Spill the Beans commentary write, the authority of the world all about power and wealth and appearance and the trappings of armies and weapons and destructive force contrasts with the authority of God that is countercultural, intimate, humble, hopeful, and transformative, not in a destructive way, but in order to construct a new kind of kingdom. Entering, entering Jerusalem to face certain death, Jesus rode humbly along without a show of strength. He entered the city without power and might, a show that there was an alternative way. And so the whole city was stirred up asking, who is this? It's the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee, they were told. Now, as I've already said, we're, we're living on the other side of the resurrection. So we know what happened. We know the end of the story. But sometimes we forget that the only way to get to the resurrection is through the cross. The resurrection comes on the other side of death. Well, there's a lot of fear in the world over COVID-19, and not without cause. The mortality rate in the U.S. is projected to be about 10 times that of the seasonal flu. Compounding its lethality is the huge disparity of symptoms for those who have been infected. Some people have been known to test positive for the virus without showing any symptoms, while others who may be otherwise healthy have been quickly overwhelmed by the virus. The reality is none of us can escape death. It is something each and every one of us must go through. Now granted, I myself would rather go through it later than sooner, but it's going to come when it's going to come. I could worry about when it will happen. I could live in fear, or I could choose an alternative way. 
I could choose to live and to love while I'm alive. Peter W. Marty, the editor and publisher of the Christian Century magazine, writes about John's account of Jesus' death, which depicts Jesus hanging on a cross and saying, I'm thirsty. And after receiving a sponge dipped in sour wine, Jesus said, it's finished. Then as the gospel tells it, Jesus bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. Marty writes, when Jesus says, it is finished, the Greek word is teleste, from which teleo or telos comes. His life has reached its proper end or goal in terms not of depletion, but completion, not of quitting, but fulfilling. Jesus has accomplished that for which he came into the world. He attains his telos, his purpose, embodying the love command in its many expressions. In the end, Jesus dies a completed life, not a finished off life, a completed life, an alternative, alternative way. I saw a video online this week by Nadia Boltz Weber entitled A Mini Sermon in a Fearful Time, in which she preached on the, a passage from Luke, specifically Luke chapter 13, verses 31 through 34. And in this passage, some Pharisees warned Jesus that Herod wanted to kill him. But Jesus wasn't afraid, even though he knew what would happen to him. Jesus continued to go about his work healing and teaching. Jesus continued to love and live. Jesus knew that even after saying it is finished, it would not be the end of the story. It would not negate the life he lived. His life was complete. Boltz Weber states that the words fear not or their equivalent appear in the Bible over 100 times. And she says, she believes that Jesus was the embodiment of be not afraid. And yet, we find passages where Jesus asked God, for example, to take this cup from me before finally giving himself fully to God. So as incredible as Jesus' faith and confidence was, does that in any way take away the fear of those of us who believe? I'm not sure it does. There's a talk line in Pink Floyd's The Great Gig in the Sky from the Dark Side of the Moon album where a man can be heard saying in the background of the music, and I am not frightened of dying. Any time will do. I don't mind. Why should I be frightened of dying? There's no reason for it. You've got to go sometime. And that is how I feel. And I've, I've often said as much but it doesn't mean that I'm without fear. What I do fear is what those I leave behind will feel. I fear for their pain at their loss of my presence in their life. Well, there have been some reports of some churches and some pastors <clears throat> defying the stay-at-home orders and continuing to worship with their entire congregation's presence. Some have said they put their confidence in God to protect them. Well, Boltz Weber hit on this in her sermon when she discussed the last part of the message in John that she was preaching on. And in that passage, Jesus talked about being a mother hen. But that does not mean that God, that Jesus, protects us from bad things, she says. She says, nothing actually keeps danger from being danger. A mother hen cannot keep a determined fox from killing her children. She goes on to say that if this image of Jesus as a mother hen cannot keep us safe through faith, then what good is it? And she answered, today 
I started to think that it's not safety that keeps us from being unafraid. Maybe it's love. Which means a mother hen of a god doesn't keep foxes from being dangerous. A mother hen of a god keeps foxes from being what determines how we experience the unbelievably beautiful gift of being alive. Such a love as shown to us in God, in Jesus Christ, helps us to remember that we belong. It helps us to remember who we are and whose we are. Faith doesn't eliminate danger. Danger is not optional, Boltz Weber says, but maybe, maybe she says fear is. Maybe, she says, the opposite of fear is not bravery, but love. When we are facing our own Herods, as a people of faith, we have an open invitation to respond in love rather than in fear. Because it is what Jesus did. As Boltz Weber intones the dangers that exist, what she calls the Herods of the world, do not get to determine the contours of our heart nor the contents of our mind. Fear does nothing to keep the bad things from happening. It just steals the joy of appreciating the good things around us. Fear steals the joy of appreciating the good around us. And she finished her sermon by saying, and so, love the world, good people. But you know, for now, do it from home. And so, we, so while we cannot gather for a parade, and it's likely that we cannot gather in person for Easter next week, we can celebrate the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We can live and joy and appreciate the good. We can love the world. On this very different yet familiar Palm Sunday, may you find the joy in appreciating the unbelievable gift that is life. May you find ways to connect and bond with your loved ones and your community from the comfort of your own home. And may the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit guide you and keep you until we can once again celebrate the resurrection as a physically gathered people of God. For remember, God's love always wins. But for now, enjoy the connection from home. Amen. And now I'd like you to enjoy a... Oh, let us pray together in the time of the pandemic the prayer that's on your screen. May we who are merely inconvenienced remember those whose lives are at stake. May we who have no risk factors remember those who are vulnerable. May we who have the luxury of working from home remember those who must choose between preserving their health or making their rent. May we who have the flexibility to care for our children when their schools close, remember those who have no option. May we who have to cancel trips, remember those who have no safe place to go. May we who are losing our margin money in the tumult of the economic market, remember those who have no margin at all. May we who settle in for a quarantine at home remember those who have no home. As fear grips our country, let us choose love. During this time when we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other, let us yet find ways to be the living embrace of God to our neighbors. Amen. And now, I, before we... Oh, I miss, missed a link. Well, let us now, before we close, 
in our benediction, let us, I invite you to join in enjoying a video hymn, courtesy of a United Methodist congregation. And just let me get back to the slide presentation. The joys of technology. Let the same mind be in you that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look not to rewards and celebrity for your good deeds. Do unto others what will nurture God's will for them. Listen to the word of the Lord and believe. Go in peace, assured of God's presence with you with the mind of Christ Jesus as your path and guide and the constant companionship of the Holy Spirit. Our worship has ended. Now our now service begins. begins. And as we close, Sally Myers will play some parting music and I invite you to contemplate the take home idea and the household prayers for the week. Thank you and have a blessed day.